Hey everyone, welcome to chapter 19 of Mary Ibn Hone, Human Anatomy and Physiology. Uh, the chapter title is Blood Vessels. You guys have probably heard this before that if you could take all of, all of your blood vessels out of your body and line them up end to end, they would wrap around the world twice. And that is actually true, um, theoretically. We've never tried it, but that's actually true. Actually, it's a little bit of an under an underestimate because the the circumference of the Earth is about twenty five thousand miles, and so um, if you doubled that, it'd be fifty thousand, and your major vessels would actually create about a sixty thousand mile combined length. So, pretty crazy, and that's just due to the capillaries. The capillaries are these dense, tiny arteries that. Um, form these very intricate and dense capillary beds and if we were to line those up they'd become quite long. <clears throat> um, three major vessel types, arteries which carry blood away from the heart, typically oxygenated blood but not always, um, capillaries <clears throat> which are the exchange vessels. This is where oxygen leaves your blood, carbon dioxide returns, um, fluid leaves and, and is added to the interstitial fluid, the tissue fluid, and wastes are exchanged, ions are exchanged, etc. Um, veins carry blood towards the heart, typically hypooxygenated, usually with a diminished amount of oxygen, again, but not always. Um, and really the better way of saying that is arteries carried oxygenated blood in the systemic circulatory system. Veins carry hypooxygenated blood in the systemic circulatory system. Those roles are reversed in the pulmonary circuit and pulmonary circulation. Okay, so we're going to look at structure. So all blood vessels, so veins, arterioles, um, arteries, with the exception of capillaries, have three distinct layers or tunics surrounding a central hollow cavity called a lumen. Um, one of those vessels, this is not true for capillaries. Um, capillaries are made up only of a tunica intima. They just have a single cell layer tunica intima, sometimes two, and these cells are actually forming the wall. Just one layer of cells is forming the tube that wraps around the lumen in a capillary. But um, the tunica intima is actually present in all blood vessels. It's uh, referred to as the endothelium. It's a sheet of endothelial cells, epithelial cells, that lines the entire cardiovascular system. The tunica media um, is uh, made up of smooth muscle and elastin, and it's the intermediate layer. It's in between the outer tunica externa and the inner tunica intima and it has both the last and fibers and smooth muscle cells. It is innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system has its effectors, its targets are these smooth muscle cells and it can actually cause constriction and dilation and change the diameter of a blood vessel. <clears throat> now the diameter of a blood vessel make, has a huge impact on flow resistance. And resistance is a, is a way that you can increase blood pressure. If you increase resistance, you, you decrease flow, but you increase blood pressure. So by constricting and making the diameter smaller, your blood pressure goes up. Exterior to the tunica media, uh, you have the tunica externa. This is interwoven collagen fibers. We've always described collagen like a rope. Um, if there's slack on the rope, the rope can extend. But as soon as the slack is gone, it has a very high tensile pressure and there's no stretch. There's no extensibility to collagen. So collagen is a strong, tough material that kind of sets an outermost boundary for the blood vessel. The blood vessel can't dilate, you know, or it can't expand beyond a certain point. It's a container for the blood vessel. Um, and it gives it strength and supports it. So quick question, which branch of the ANS innervates blood vessels? Um, well, you only, you only heard me mention one, and that was sympathetic. 
the sympathetic division innervates blood vessels and it innervates the smooth muscle within the tunica media in particular and the effectors within that tunica media are the smooth muscle cells um, when that smooth muscle contracts what happens to the diameter of the blood vessel it goes down the diameter decreases that's called vasoconstriction um, when it when the smooth muscle relaxes and the diameter goes up, that's called vasodilation. Okay, so let's look at three types of arteries really quick. Uh, the first are called elastic arteries. There aren't many of these. These are just the major vessels leaving the heart, like the aorta and the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries. Um, what's unique about this type of artery is it has a ton it's not very scientific sorry but it has a ton of elastic fibers in it as also has a very large tunica media um, and what these vessels can do is they can expand under high pressure and then they can actually exert force and squeeze the vessel under lower pressure so it sort of acts as a buffer um, it buffers against really high pressures and then it buffers against really low pressures. It narrows the band of maximum and minimum pressures by being elastic. Uh, sometimes the aorta is referred to as being an auxiliary heart because the heart contracts, fills it with blood. It expands so as not to have a huge spike in pressure. So your blood pressure is not like 200 in your aorta. It's hopefully more like 120-ish. And then as the heart goes into di diastole and relaxes, as the ventricles go into diastole and relax, it continues to squeeze so that your blood pressure doesn't fall to zero. It stays at 80. So it's kind of like this pressure buffering system. It's very, very unique to the aorta and the pulmonary arteries. Beyond that, um, after we leave the aorta, most arteries we encounter until we get to the arterioles, I should say all arteries we encounter until we get to the arterioles are called muscular arteries. And here's a picture here of a muscular artery. These arteries are innervated by the sympathetic system, the tunica media specifically, and they can constrict and dilate to control and regulate blood pressure. And they distribute blood to all of the capillary beds in the body via our next structure called an arterial. An arterial is just a very small artery. You can see they're drawing the tunica media as just a couple smooth muscle cells thick. So it's very small. And it is the structure that delivers blood to the capillary beds, which is what we're going to talk about right now. So um, capillaries are simply a thin tunica intima, potentially one cell thick. Um, however, there are these other cells called pericytes that are, that are scattered around that influence the permeability of the capillary. They release certain compounds. They're really involved in the blood-brain barrier in addition to the astrocytes. So if you were to Google how many cell layers is the capillary wall, you might see some places say two. So I just wanted to put that in there. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a single cell wall tunica intima. They provide a blood supply to nearly every cell in the body. This is how oxygen gets to your tissues. This is how um, nutrients, glucose, get to your tissues. This is how wastes are removed. This is how CO2 is removed. It's all, it all happens at the capillary bed level. That's where the exchange of gases, nutrients, and hormones between the blood in the extracellular or interstitial fluid occurs. Blood cells themselves do not actually make contact with your tissues. There aren't red blood cells bumping into skeletal muscle fibers releasing oxygen. Instead, your muscle cells, all of your cells, are bathed in this interstitial fluid, and then the capillary beds are maintaining that environment within the interstitial fluid. They're delivering new oxygen, new nutrients, keeping it just the way your cells like it. We have three different types of capillaries. Uh, there's, I guess you could probably say four because there's a special capillary within your brain that's highly impermeable 
and that's your blood-brain barrier. But generally speaking, we have three kinds of capillaries. Um, the first is a continuous capillary. It's the least permeable of the three here. Then we have fenestrated capillaries, which you can see the pores. Um, they're more permeable. And then this just depends on what tissue in the body we're in. Certain tissues are going to need a higher degree of exchange. So those areas will have fenestrated capillaries, whereas other areas need less exchange, so they'll have continuous. And then there's a few specialized areas like your spleen, lymph nodes, um, bone marrow, that need a great deal of exchange. So much exchange, they actually need cells to be able to get into and out of capillaries. And those types of capillaries are called sinusoid or discontinuous capillaries. If you look how big these gaps are, you can imagine red blood cells can actually enter and exit. So why would you need that somewhere like the bone marrow? Well, that's where red blood cells are made. That's where blood cells are made. So you, they need to be able to enter circulation or exit, and they do so in this type of capillary. Same with the spleen. Uh, dead red blood cells are filtered out in the spleen, so they need to be able to exit circulation. Lymph nodes are going to have a lot of white blood cell traffic, so the cells need to be able to get in and out of circulation. Although white blood cells, interestingly, they can actually get in and out of these as well, and these. They have a lot of different adaptations to leave circulation if needed. Um, but that's a tangent, sorry. Capillary beds. So this is, this is where all the magic happens, so to speak. Um, no exchange is occurring prior to this point. Um, each capillary bed is fed by an arterial called the terminal arterial. Um, so that would be right here, the terminal arterial. And then there's something called a meta arterial and a thoroughfare channel. This is a direct link from the meta, or sorry, from the terminal arterial to the postcapillary venule. It's a one-way street, and if you look at these little smooth muscle bands, these are sphincters, precapillary sphincters. They control the blood flow into the bed. If they're constricted, the blood just moves straight through the meta arterial and thoroughfare channel to the postcapillary venule. So if you've ever been outside in the cold. Probably not the case for my students. We're all in Southern California. It snows here in the mountains, so. Um, if we're, or if you've ever been on vacation um, and you're really cold outside, so oddly, your skin actually gets cold. That may not sound odd to you, but it is kind of odd if you think about it because does that mean your blood is cold near your skin? That seems like that would be an issue if you had cold blood coming back to your heart from your skin, mixing with other blood. Yeah, that'd be a big problem for your core temperature. And you guys know our, we need to keep our core temperature at 98.6 or around there. And so we need to do something. And one of the things we would do is restrict blood flow to the capillary beds within your dermis. And so this is what happens. This right here, the blood still travels, but it just goes straight through. It doesn't go through this dense bed of capillaries radiating heat to be lost to the cold air outside. It just passes through quickly and goes back to your heart and you know where, where you need warm blood around all your visceral organs. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of interesting to me. And then if you have an area that needs more blood supply, whether it could still be your skin, but on a hot day where you want to radiate heat, or maybe skeletal muscles as you're running, then the precapillary sphincters dilate and they allow blood into the capillary bed into what are called true capillaries. These are the true capillaries. And in this top picture, you see the sphincters open and the blood is profuse and 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 full and um flowing through the capillary bed if you uh, push down on like your fingernail and let go you can see it turns white and then turns pink quickly um then if you have good capillary refill it happens almost immediately but you can see what happens when you actually push the blood out of a capillary bed and then you can watch it return it's kind of cool um so so that, that means that, you know, those capillary beds are, are open and filled with blood and then you push them and the blood is pressed out and then it returns quickly. 
Let's talk about the venous system for a bit. Uh, we, we saw our first venule. We saw the post-capillary venule. Venule is kind of the counterpart of an arterial. It's a very small vein, and then they, they feed veins. Um, and as you get closer to the heart, those veins get bigger and bigger. Um, they are capacitance vessels. So arteries are pressure vessels. They're muscular, they constrict, they dilate. Um, although veins can do that as well, but they're, they're, they're rigid, they're muscular, they don't expand much. Uh, veins are capacitance vessels. They can expand quite a bit under pressure to the point that um, on average, about 65% of our blood supply is actually in our veins. So veins, uh, if you if you think about it, I mean, I I don't I don't want to speak out of school here. Let me look it up. I think it's a 15 millimeter per mercury pressure gradient. Yes, uh, there's only a 15 millimeter mercury pressure gradient um, between the venules, the post capillary venules, and your vena cava and your atrium, your right atrium which is the end of systemic circulation. So that's not much much of a pressure gradient. Imagine a venule in your big toe is at 15 millimeters mercury, and that blood needs to travel all the way up to your heart, and there's only a 15 millimeter mercury pressure difference. It's not exactly rushing up against gravity in that situation. Compare that to you know your aorta needing to push blood into your big toe. Well, the capillary bed has a pressure of about 35, let's say, at the beginning, at the meta arterial, and a systemic systolic blood pressure in the aorta of 120, that's a 90 millimeter mercury pressure gradient. That's much bigger. The blood is going to flow under pressure quickly to your foot. And in that case, it's even assisted by gravity. So how do we reconcile that? We have blood rushing down under pressure with gravity into our foot, how come our foot just doesn't balloon up, <laughs> you know, um, because our veins are under low pressure? Well, the veins dilate quite a bit. So even though it's less pressure, the flow is, is the same. The flow is continuous. And so another way they compensate from that decreased pressure is they have venous valves. So <clears throat> you're sitting down, the blood's kind of pooling in your veins, your veins are expanded, and then you stand up and all your muscles contract and they squeeze those veins. And because of the valve, the blood can only travel in one direction. And we have a better slide for that later, sorry. <clears throat> um, you guys know from lab that we have some interesting collateral blood flow patterns around joints. Um, if you think about the knee, for example, we have all the geniculars that wrap around the knee. Um, in the elbow, we have the radial recurrent, the interosseous recurrent. We have, we didn't talk about it in our lab, but the profunda brachii has um, an ascending recurrent, a radial collateral, a middle collateral artery. These are all arteries that provide alternative blood flow pathways around joints because if your elbow's in full flexion, let's say, you might be occluding some arteries. So, that's not good. So we have secondary pathways, and these are called anastomoses. And in that, well, really an anastomosis is just when two blood vessels join, when two blood vessels connect. So most of our joints have these arterial anastomoses, our heart and our brain do as well. But then we also have arteriovenous anastomoses, the meta-arterial thoroughfare channel, which we just learned about a couple slides ago. And then we have venous anastomoses, which are very common. There are tons of venous anastomoses. And if you've ever known someone with like varicose veins, you know, you see billboards for getting them removed. And you might think, well, then what, just, what happens? How does that blood get back to the heart? Well, there are a lot of anastomoses. So if you remove one vein, the, the flow, there's some alternative flow pathway, some alternative blood flow um, route that the blood can take. Okay, um, so let's talk flow really quick. Uh, when you think of blood flow, think about volume over time. So it's the amount of blood passing a given point over a given period of time. Um, that's different from pressure. Pressure can be wildly different in different parts of your circulatory system, but the flow should be relatively continuous. Otherwise, you're going to have blood backing up in different parts of the body. Um, 
pressure and resistance uh, determine flow. So um, resistance is influenced by three factors, viscosity, if you get really dehydrated, your viscosity could change. Blood vessel length is, is constant in our body. Um, more, or less, I mean, yeah, fairly constant at least. Pathways could change. You could include one pathway and there'd be an alternate pathway that might be longer or shorter. But generally speaking, this is a fixed thing. What's highly variable and very influential over resistance, the most influential, is blood vessel diameter. The sympathetic nervous system can change your vessel diameter and that changes your pressure. If it constricts, that increases resistance, but at the same time, it also increases pressure. So it doesn't have as it doesn't have much effect on flow necessarily. Uh, it could potentially even increase flow um, in, in, in some ways by increasing pressure, but uh, it also has a big influence on resistance. So let's look at this kind of formulaically and define these terms a little bit better. So flow is directly proportional to the difference in pressure between two points in circulation. Uh, delta P is what that's called. So if the mean arterial pressure in your aorta is 90 um, and the mean arterial pressure, well, it wouldn't be arterial pressure. The, the, if the pressure in your right atrium is approaching zero, so the aorta is the start of systemic circulation, the right atrium is the end, or you could say the vena cava. The pressure there is going to be close to zero. Um, then delta P is about 90 or 100, whatever I said uh, the aortic pressure was, okay? because there's a 90 millimeter mercury difference in pressure between those two points. That's also called the hydrostatic pressure gradient. Um, flow is inversely proportional to resistance. So resistance decreases flow, delta P increases flow. I think there's going to be a um, SpaceX rocket launch today and they always talk about delta V which is the difference in velocity. Um, and that always reminds me of delta P, the difference in pressure. So delta just means, you know, what's the difference between um, two, two things. In terms of delta V, it's, hey, we're going 10,000 miles an hour and we need to be going 3,000 miles an hour to enter the atmosphere or whatever. Um, delta P is, hey, the aorta is 100 millimeters mercury the capillary bed is 30, so that is a 70 millimeter mercury delta P. And that describes how steep, how strong your pressure gradient is. And then you need to take resistance into account though, because resistance will be much higher in the arterial system than in the venous system. So the delta P is in everything. Flow is actually equal to delta P divided by resistance. <clears throat> so the three factors that determine resistance, viscosity, vessel length, vessel diameter, which is most important, vessel diameter. So we're going to talk about how pressure differs in different vessels and how these gradients work a little bit more. This is actually a really cool diagram. Just look at it for a second and try to figure it out before we dive in. You might notice on the um, bottom, we have different vessels, aorta, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, vena cava. So that's the X axis. And then on the Y axis, we have pressure. So what do you, what do you notice about this right off, off the bat? You probably are like, what in the world is this weird tornado-esque funnel-shaped thing? So there's a lot of different things going on. So Look at this spiky sawtooth line right here. This is the pressure in the aorta and the arteries. Well, what's different about the aorta and the arteries and even the arterioles than the capillaries, venules, veins of vena cava? Well, they're much closer to the heart and pressure is much higher. So they can feel the pulsatile pressure of the heart, especially in the aorta. Look, during diastole, 
after in ventricular relaxation, pressure is low, it's 80. And then after ventricular ejection, ventricular systole, contraction, it goes all the way up to 120. So it's a highly pulsatile um, situation. Blood pressure is pulsatile, it's going up and down. Uh, the peak pressure, the pressure during maximal ventricular contraction is called the systolic blood pressure. And then the, the bottom line, the minimum pressure is called the diastolic blood pressure during ventricular diastole. And then if we're taking blood pressure at the brachial artery, we're taking it, you know, right around here. Um, so, but then the farther away you get from the heart, you can see this pulsatile pressure decreases. When you get to the arterioles, it's pretty minuscule. And then by the time you get to the capillaries, it's no longer pulsatile. <clears throat> this would even be more pulsatile if the aorta wasn't so elastic. If the heart was pumping into a muscular artery, the peak pressure could be like, you know, 160 and the minimum pressure could be like 60. You could have this wild swing. And that difference between those two numbers is called the pulse pressure. Um, so, oh, sorry, people are texting me. Um, that difference is called the pulse pressure, which in this case would be about 40. Then we have another line right here. It looks like it starts about 95 maybe. And that's the mean pressure or the mean arterial pressure, the MAP. That's the average pressure within the vessel. Um, and then, so you can see that the blood is entering the capillaries at maybe around 38, 37 millimeters mercury, maybe 35, I think is what I have written down in the presentation. And then it's exiting in the high teens, like maybe 17 or 18. So that's the pressure gradient in the capillary beds. The pressure gradient is less in the venules and then even less in the veins. That's not much delta P in the veins. And we said earlier, it's about 15, and that looks about right, maybe even a little bit less because, well, no, that would be 10, that would be 15. So yeah, it's it's a small, small pressure gradient. And this is what we just said. Blood enters at 35 and exits at 17 in the capillary beds. All right, so Veins are super interesting because we know the pressure gradient is low and we know that the pressure is steady, it's non pulsatile So what do we do? What do the veins do? Well, they have three functional adaptations to promote venous return. Um, the first is called the muscular pump and that one, that one's pretty cool. It's, it's pictured in this photo right here. You have a bunch of blood in your vein. It can't flow backwards because you have one-way valves then you stand up, all your muscles contract, it squeezes the veins. We don't want them forcing blood backwards. So those valves close and blood is forced upwards. You create little mini pressure gradients. You exaggerate the delta P at little portions of the vein. And this works its way up. The blood ratchets its way up back to the heart. That's why it's not great to just sit around. If you've ever worked in a hospital and you see people just bed bound in the hospital bed, you'll often see, you know, lower extremity edema. Um, it's very common. And a lot of that's just due to not moving. Some of that's due to, you know, right sided heart failure and high blood pressure and other things too, of course, but it's definitely exacerbated by not moving because you no longer have a muscular pump. Fortunately, you do have always, as long as you're alive, the respiratory pump. This keeps things from getting really, really over the top bad in most people in terms of edema. And um, that is because, picture your diaphragm for a second. It divides the abdominal and thoracic cavities. When it contracts, it squishes all your viscera down. It increases the pressure in your abdominal cavity and at the same time decreases the pressure in your thoracic cavity. So that creates a delta P in the veins in your abdomen. It increases pressure there and forces it up towards the heart. Um, this can only do so much. The muscular pump is really good at getting the blood out of your legs in particular and your extremities. But this respiratory pump helps do pulsatile increases in delta P to get blood flow back to the heart. And then, um, Veins like arteries can vasoconstrict, not to the same degree as arteries, but they can vasoconstrict. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system can increase 
pressure through vasoconstriction. Okay, so let's look at um, some regulation of blood pressure. Uh, neural controls are a short-term option, and they alter both cardiac output and peripheral resistance. Um, they can change heart rate, they can change contractility, they can change uh, vessel diameter, and all of this is aimed at two goals, maintaining adequate pressure and altering blood distribution based on demand. So imagine you just drink a, a gallon of water and then you go on a sprint and then you lay down flat on a couch. Your blood pressure is going to be really elevated. So the response from your sympathetic nervous system might be vasodilation. But let's say you're dehydrated and you're really relaxed and the doorbell rings and you stand up and you feel like you're going to pass out and your vision goes white or black. Um, your body's going to respond by vasoconstriction. Um, also, your sympathetic division can regulate which capillary beds are receiving the most blood through, uh, through pre-capillary sphincter constriction or dilation. So it can both maintain the appropriate pressure and uh, alter blood distribution based on need. So we have a cardiovascular center, which consists of the cardio acceleratory inhibitory center and vasomotor center. Uh, the vasomotor center transmits impulses to blood vessels and smooth muscle, causing vasoconstriction or dilation. And then the cardiovascular center, uh, well, all three centers, but um, especially the cardio acceleratory, cardio inhibitory center, no, and the vasomotor center as well, I'm sorry. So the, the entire complex of these three centers is modified by inputs from baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, and higher brain centers. So baroreceptors in particular, let me see if I have a slide I do, um, are activated by physical stretch. So they're actual stretch receptors. So it's not like a chemoreceptor measuring osmolarity or something like that. It's detecting actual strain in the blood vessel wall, particularly in the carotid sinus and the aortic arch or the aortic wedge. Um, anyway, so uh, if this can happen in either direction, but the example I list here is if, um, is if your blood pressure is high. So let's say you, you drink a bunch of water, sprinted and laid down, the baroreceptors um, would detect high strain because of the high blood pressure. The result would be a blood pressure decrease brought about um, by vasodilation, vein dilation, venodilation, and decreased cardiac output. So the cardio inhibitory center would decrease cardiac output, and then the sympathetic stimulation to the arterial and venous tunica medias would decrease causing vasodilation. And the two re reflexes that mediate this are the carotid sinus reflex and aortic reflex. Um, however, you might think, well, then how do people get high blood pressure? Because wouldn't the response just lower their blood pressure? Baroreceptors are highly adaptable. They adjust to new normals. So if you have if your blood pressure starts becoming high consistently, you stop responding to it in the same way. You adapt to the higher blood pressure. And then this diagram just walks you through that reflex. It can happen in both directions. It can happen to lower blood pressure or it can happen when you stand up after being really relaxed and you're dehydrated and then you feel your heart start to pound in an effort to get your blood pressure up. Um, it can happen in both directions. And then our last slide, we do also have chemoreceptor reflexes. This has to do with our blood's ability to carry oxygen. If our blood becomes acidic, um, which or if CO2 levels rise, which those that's kind of the chicken or the egg idea because CO2 is acidic. So if CO2 levels rise or if pH falls, the oxygen content of blood falls rapidly. There's a temperature pressure acidity curve for oxygen and if blood becomes acidic oxygen saturation falls off a cliff so you have chemoreceptors that detect these changes and respond by stimulating the cardio acceleratory center and vasomotor centers because if you have a lot of co2 
the way to get rid of CO2 is to increase blood flow, to get it out and get it back to the lungs. You also have some respiratory reflexes that will make you breathe faster uh, if you're in acidosis. So this results in increased venous return, increased CO2 um, uh, release, and a rise in pH, a decrease in acidity. Um, the PowerPoint, uh, I think I'll just try to post this one because the PowerPoint on the anponline.com website has a few more slides, but it just seemed a little like ad nauseum. Um, so I, I took those off. So I'll try to post this version on Canvas. Anyway, um, sorry, that was kind of a quick run through. As you guys know who are in my class that I had already recorded this and then I somehow managed to delete it. So it's tough not to go fast the second time around. If you have any questions or anything, uh, please feel free to text me, to reach out to me on Canvas, and we will get it figured out. Uh, I will talk to you guys on Monday for the Zoom, and we'll talk about the final. Thanks. Bye.